Hi, good evening. Welcome on this rainy Thursday evening. Welcome to this extraordinary online event and thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Tharik Kapasi. I'm a GP in Leicester City and today we have a panel of experts join us so we are able to discuss the coronavirus situation in Leicester. Leicester is in the international spotlight right now and under lockdown. We've had an increase in coronavirus cases over the last few weeks which have led to the city continuing lockdown whilst restrictions in the rest of the country are relaxed. Change in any part of our lives can cause confusion and anxiety. It is normal for us to feel frustrated given we have already endured months of lockdown. We hope during this discussion today, you're gonna to be able to gain some clarity and perspective on the situation and understand why we are where we are. As health professionals who are fighting this pandemic, I've seen many of our patients firsthand deal with the consequences of this pandemic. So we hope during this discussion today, you're gonna to be able to gain some clarity and perspective on the situation and understand where we are. Over, the, over 800 people have died in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland over the last few months. I, like many of my colleagues, have been involved in caring for people with coronavirus in life and before the end of life. I've had many of our patients admitted to hospital where the expertise and skill of our local hospitals have saved many lives. Equally, a handful of patients who, who I have had the privilege of caring for over the last few years have also sadly died. From the 80 year old man who always left me with a smile when he consulted with me, to the mother of young teenage children who died at the age of 40, this disease has affected many of us. Whilst thankfully over 80% of cases of coronavirus are mild, my patients, friends and families of those affected will tell you that this disease is very real. It does not discriminate and is invisible. Despite this, there are lots of things we can do to prevent the spread of this disease. My colleagues and I have produced some videos in various languages, which you can find in our YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and you search for Willow's Health, you can look for the Purple Heart. The videos are in English, Punjabi, Urdu, Gujarati, Hindi, Swahili, Polish, Cantonese, Tamil, Arabic, the list really does go on. We've made these videos because they represent the languages of the, of the people in this great and diverse city. And it's clear to me that the strength of this city can be represented by this tremendous diversity. If we unify ourselves in a single effort, there is little doubt we can move on from this pandemic. Our three panelists today are experienced experts in their field. Today, we've probably got the busiest man in the country, Professor Ivan Brown, who's Director of Public Health in Leicester City, who's doing everything he can do to get Leicester back on his feet. We're also delighted to have Dr. Aruna Garcia join us. She is a local GP and Clinical Director of the Leicester City and University Primary Care Network. Our final panellist is Dr. Rajiv Wadwa. He is experienced GP and has a practice in Highfields where there has been a spike of cases in Leicester City. We do wish for this webinar to be interactive. If you have any questions, then please put them into the chat box and we will try our best to answer them. There's also a subtitle feature on this webinar, which allows you to view a live transcript in various languages. And if you want to click on the fourth box to your left, I am told that you can actually scroll through different languages for which you may require transcript on. I'm now going to hand the floor to Professor Ivan Brown. So Professor Ivan Brown, it's been a really busy time in Leicester so, over the last few months. Thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, what I would just like to say before we start this is, is this is this for me is 
really a fantastic opportunity um, to actually be able to talk to my fellow citizens of Leicester um, who are engaged in this. There's a, been a huge interest around this. So I'm really delighted that we have the opportunity to, to have a bit of time to share together and we can raise some, some questions and hopefully some answers. Um, I'm going to really try to focus and try and keep this relatively short because the most important thing here is to be able to speak to you and to be able to uh, answer some of your questions. But one thing, I've got a few reflections that I would just want to bring into uh, this discussion as a public health professional and as the director of public health. So one of the things we need to remember and we're constantly remember is that COVID-19 is a pandemic. It is across the world. It's being manifested in many, many different ways across many, many different communities. It's been interesting watching how the public health response has been varied, where some have managed it well and, and some have really struggled. And whilst we're having that dialogue in the background about what is happening around the world, suddenly this important issue becomes particularly pertinent to us here in Leicester. Uh, and for me, um, as a public health professional, that's that's important uh, for our learning, but most importantly, it's really important that we manage this collectively the best way we can. One of my uh, narratives that sits around this is that the solution as we stand at the moment to manage COVID-19 lies with every single one of us as individuals. There is no vaccine. There are no antivirals. It is really about what we do as individuals, as families, and as communities. And I think one of the things that I've learned during the course of this is you know, there was a lot of conversations at the beginning about COVID-19 being the great leveler, that it would affect everybody in the same way. What we're seeing is that is not the case. What we're seeing is that there are people that are disproportionately affected across our communities, particularly communities like Leicester. And it really shows the challenge that we face even post this pandemic in relation to inequalities, in relation to making sure that everybody has fair and equal access to healthcare and a good quality of life. So what I would just want to say to you is, we are all going to be in this together. The solution is going to be with us together. And I look forward to being able to provide something that might be able to support that endeavor. And I thank you already for the efforts that we have made as a community to try and address the problem of COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brown. That's a really useful introduction to the webinar today. Um, and, and clearly one of the messages that we really wish to put across today, that there is no vaccine. And that means that that responsibility to fight this pandemic really rests in our own selves, in our own families, in our own households, in our own communities. And it's clear that Leicester has been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. And it's really interesting you talk about health inequalities, and that's something we can perhaps take during this webinar, or even consider how to challenge that in the future. I'm going to come to our next panelist, um, and our next panelist is Dr. Aruna Garcia. So Dr. Garcia, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Kassi. Thank you, Professor Brown. I'm really pleased to be here. <clears throat> Just for those of you that don't know me, I'm a GP, a local GP and a lead of the local, the Leicester City and Universities Primary Care Network. Just for those of you that aren't aware of primary care networks, um, basically all of your GP practices are, are clubbing together in a primary care network to serve their communities. The reason that I'm here today and Dr Rajiv Wadwa is that we got together since the news of the lock, lock, lockdown because we wanted to reach out and ensure that you were receiving all the information in a meaningful way that meant the needs of our cultural and ethnic diversity as Ivan has told us about are met. Um, we hope that we can address some of your concerns through the questions today um, and look forward to engaging with you this evening. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. And finally, we have Dr. Wadwa, who has been a practicing GP for many years, serving the people of Leicester. And really importantly, Dr. Wadwa does serve patients in a part of Leicester 
where people have been disproportionately affected by coronavirus. So, Dr. Wandwerk, welcome. It's lovely to have you. Thank you, Dr. Kupasi, uh, Prof. Brown, uh, Dr. Garcia. It's a privilege to be here. It's quite exciting to see so many uh, people joining us live, uh, and I hope we can answer some of their questions. We can allay some of their concerns and reassure them. Uh, you're right, uh, my practice is in middle of high fields, one of the areas uh, really badly affected with this research uh, in Leicester. And as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Kapasi, I've seen um, very closely how this disease can devastate families um, and communities. So yes, um, a privilege to be here. Thank you, Dr. Wadwa. Now, I think first of all, our public are going to have lots and lots of questions to answer. Um, that they would like us to answer lots of questions that they have. But before we begin, I think we really need to build upon the foundations of knowledge that we may may have or may not have. And so we're going to go back to the basics of coronavirus um, so that we understand exactly what we're dealing with before we get to the questions the public are asking. So Professor Brown, it's been a few months that we've had the coronavirus and we've forgotten perhaps about the basics. And I think it's really important for us to remind ourselves of the basics. What is the novel coronavirus? OK, so um, just to remind you, some of you will remember some time ago um, when we had swine flu. Uh, and, and the issue was that this was a new virus. It was a, a, a virus that had combined um, to form something brand new which meant that normally uh, it's amazing how the body fights against viruses because, you know, they've seen them before or they've seen something similar to that before. When a new virus is created, whether it's, you know, through the, 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 the amalgamation of what happens with a human virus and what happens with an animal virus, this is brand new to the body. You know, we don't have the ability to fight it off. There isn't somebody who's been exposed to that in some time in the past. So suddenly we all become vulnerable. We all are in a position where something could happen to us. Now, the difference between this and when we were dealing with the, the swine flu pandemic is fairly quickly, we were able to produce antivirals, we were able to produce vaccines to help us. And the way that it spread uh, was, was much more difficult. But the thing is the coronavirus that we've seen is it spreads really quickly. You know, your, your exposure can be relatively, relatively small. And we've heard quite a lot of that discussion in the recent weeks about um, not only might it be just born by touching or close proximity, there's now conversations that it goes beyond droplets and that it can hang around in the air for a little while. So it has a lot of, lot of the things that make it a great virus from the point of view of it being able to do its job, but a terrible virus for us. Thanks, Professor Brown. And um, Dr. Garcia, just remind us of the typical symptoms of coronavirus. And also just remind us, does everybody who has the coronavirus infection show symptoms? Thanks, Dr. Kapasi. Yeah, just really to remind everybody, I'm sure that we are sort of aware of it, but remember COVID-19 is part of, it's part of the sort of flu-like sort of family. So therefore, we do get flu-like symptoms, which are things like runny nose, sore throat, temperature, body aches, etc. But there are a few symptoms that seem to be quite unique. And in particular, we tend to find that people have quite a high temperature. Um, people are coming in with coughs. They can be dry and they can be, they can be wet, so we can produce sputum from them. We tend to be a little bit unwell with them, so we can be unwell with it. So we get quite short of breath within a few cases when it's a little bit more severe. And unusually, quite and quite unique to probably to COVID, is that you can lose your sense of smell or sense of taste in your mouth. So if that happens, make sure that you speak to somebody or that you find out, call 111, your GP, etc. Remember, some of us though have milder illness and may not have these symptoms. And it's really important to remember that when you, you may feel more fatigued than normal. So if you're finding more difficult to get, go up the stairs, get around, just finding you're a bit more tired, it might be something to think about. 
And don't forget that there are eight, what we call atypical symptoms, which means that they're not that common. So things like diarrheal, Ill, diarrhea, vomiting, and particularly in our older relatives or our, our, our friends, they may present not with a temperature and a cough, but they may present just not being well, a little bit confused, maybe behaving a little bit oddly um, and just not being well in themselves. So we need to think about COVID in those situations. Dr. Carthy, you mentioned something about asymptomatic um, or people without symptoms, and this is a really important aspect of our lockdown, basically. We do think, so as, as Dr. as Professor Brown mentioned, that we do end, we can acquire the virus and before we can hold it in our bodies before we get symptoms, and that's called a pre-symptomatic phase. There are some of us that won't get any symptoms at all, and that's what we refer to when we're talking about asymptomatic carriage. That's about 10 to 30 percent, we think, in the community, depending on where you look and on the information that's out there at the moment. If you think about it, if we've got 10 to 30 percent carriage and the really high infectivity of COVID for every one of us that's carrying it without letting anybody know or knowing it ourselves, we can end up infecting three to four for, for all those days that we don't have the symptoms. So it's really important that we think about getting tested um, if particularly in, when we're in lockdown. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. I think that's a really key point. The fact that you can spread coronavirus infection to vulnerable people without having symptoms yourself. And I think Professor Brown had alluded to the fact that the key in getting us out of lockdown is with our own selves and perhaps actually if we stop the spread of this virus, we reduce the numbers and we come out of lockdown. I suppose in many ways it's as simple as that. So I just want to touch about how the virus spreads and what we can do to stop the virus from spreading, because I, I suspect these are the key parts of the armory we have to fight this pandemic. Professor Brown, how does the virus spread and what can we do to prevent that spread? Sorry, I was on mute. Apologies. I knew I'd be the first. Um, so, so this 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 virus spreads um, person to person. So you you would have you would have seen a lot of the measures that we're speaking about are really about trying to understand that virus. So, it, because it spreads person to person, we have that issue about social distancing. It's about droplet transmission. That's why we have the conversation about being two meters apart. That's why we have the conversation about making sure that in your enclosed setting that you wear a face mask. But equally, um, it also can uh, be affected by touching surfaces that somebody else has touched who's got the virus. That's why we have the conversation about making sure you wash your hands thoroughly. So the virus uses a, a range of ways to try to get to us. Um, so that, that's how we pass it on. So in our households, in our workplaces, in our social settings, it will look for any opportunity for it to get into our bodies, you know, through 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 our eyes, through our nose, you know, th to try and spread it to, to spread and multiply. Thank you, Professor Brown. So clearly, three or four things that we need to be doing: hand washing, 20 seconds regularly, social distancing, two meters. So the virus doesn't actually spread from one person to another. And face masks. Um, I think there's something to be said about face masks. We need to address the culture of wearing face masks, because if you look at people from the Asian subcontinent, you see everybody wearing face masks. Whereas in this country, or if you look to America, we don't see people wearing face masks as readily. What is the guidance on face masks? And do we really need to fight that culture of not wearing a face mask? Because this is an invisible virus. We have to protect ourselves. Isn't that right, Professor Brown? Absolutely. I mean, it's been really interesting just watching the, the, the shift within our own culture um, in relation to that. I think we all used to see, you know, 
students that, were, that came from Asia wearing face masks and we'd all look at them quite, 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 quite oddly and think, well, why is that? Um, but now what we're seeing is uh, that the best evidence that we have is that in order to protect others, you know, because that point that, that Dr. Garcia made, which is we, we might not even know that we have the virus and, and we could be spreading the virus. So face coverings help us help us to to prevent that from happening. Um, and, and equally, we're in, we're in a battle. And when you're in a battle, you use all the weapons that are available to you. So, yes, whilst the, the, the primary ones that are, are about distancing and staying at home and reducing your exposure, you know, uh, masks are another level that if you do have to go out and if you are in an enclosed space, that again, what can I do to offer a degree of protection? And again, this is, is one of the, the, the methods there. Um, in this battle, I think we just have to use everything that's in our armory. Thank you, Professor Brown. So clearly, face coverings are something we should be utilising readily. So it may be that we have to use face coverings in certain areas. So what's the guidance about using face coverings? When should I actually use one? The initial guidance was, I mean, the, the guidance talks about on public transport. Um, but as the other areas have started to speak about the reductions in places like the mitigation in places like restaurants and bars and so forth. I mean, I think the, my, my view is relatively simple, which is if you are going to be in any enclosed space where social distancing can be problematic, you need some way, some form of mitigation uh, and a face mask is part of that. I mean, it is the most important thing, of course, is try not to put yourself in that position, try to put yourself in a, in a way where that droplet spread can't happen. Um, but if you are in that, a, another line of defence can be a face mask, but do not rely on that as your first line of defence. Thank you. There's something else. So um, I was driving, I was in a central trip, um, and I saw people walking down the street and I saw them wearing face coverings, but the way they were wearing the face coverings didn't sit right with me. Professor Brown, could you educate us on how we're supposed to use face coverings and how sometimes if we use face coverings in the incorrect way, it can actually increase our risk? Absolutely. And I think you've made, raised a, a really valid point. And I think earlier on in the discussion about face face coverings, th this, this was a pertinent point. And that was the fact that with face coverings, uh, you, you need to put them in, on, on in such a way that you're not actually spreading the virus. So if you've not washed your hands thoroughly, you could actually be increasing your risk of the virus if you do not put the face covering on correctly. So it really is important that when you're when you're using that, that you you put it on in, in such a way that you're first of all that your hands are clean uh, before you put it on. You need to put it over your nose and your mouth and secure it under your chin. So it's really using a really hygienic way of doing it, and don't use face coverings forever and ever and ever you know you need to you need to be washing them on a regular basis you need to have more than one so that as they start to become more moisture bound that you get rid of those and you can change it so it's about using them in 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 the right way to get your maximum effect that's really useful professor brown so just to reiterate it really needs to be covering your your nose and your mouth yeah and we ought not to be using the face coverings recurrently and we sh should have multiple face coverings. Washing your hands also seems like a really important thing to do before using a face covering. Um, I also wanted to touch on gloves if I may because I see a lot of people wearing gloves and as a healthcare professional I also wear gloves and I will actually put the gloves on before I see a patient, take them off after I've seen somebody and then wash my hands. Normal people in the public aren't going to have access to hundreds and hundreds of gloves after every interaction. This makes me think that that might actually increase their risk. What, what are your thoughts on this? I, I would absolutely agree with that. I understand why people want to be safe or, or feel <laughs> safe. It's that feeling of safety and people feel that if I put on a pair of gloves, somehow I am safe. Uh, unfortunately, the virus doesn't recognise your gloves. 
uh, and, and the virus will quite happily stick to that. So you will go there, you've got your gloves on, you still touch your face or you still greet somebody, you are just going to pass the virus on. So we have to be really careful about, and I, that was the point I was making about face coverings, that it's important, but that is not your first line of defense. Unless you are making every, in every transaction, you get rid of your, your gloves, they are actually more dangerous. The best thing you can do is wash your hands for that 20 seconds with soap and water. Um, if you can't get that, then, then you can use, uh, you know, uh, you, you can use a, an anti-back wash or, or whatever. But actually, you're far better having a very strong regime of washing your hands regularly. Please try to avoid the use of gloves that you just keep on forever and, and, and feel that you're safe in relation to that. Thank you, Professor Brown. There's a last question on, on the spread of the virus, and it's a question that's popped up on the forum. And it was on the news yesterday. So I, I saw this on the news yesterday too, Prof Brown. So the World Health Organization suggested the virus could also be transmitted in a different way through airborne droplets. What does that mean? And do we have to take any additional precautions as a result of that? So, so this 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 conversation has been around for a while because this whole thing about the virus is it's brand new. We're learning. It's like somebody reminded me. They say it, it, we're, it's almost like we're we're building the plane while we're flying it. Um, and one of the things that we're we're finding is we're finding new data all the time about this. And one of the one of the theories was. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about droplets and when we're measuring two meters we're thinking well how far would somebody sneeze two meters maybe you know or, or sing um so that's what where we got that social distancing idea from but there has been a, a school of thought that says that actually much smaller than droplets um that, that, that the virus is still viable where it just sort of hangs in the air for a little longer uh, and that allows people to walk past and 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 uh, be in an in, in enclosed environment and be exposed to the virus now the world health organization have to this point kind of resisted that 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 notion but what they're saying is now for the first time is that is a possibility i don't think it's definitive at this stage but they've acknowledged that that is something that they need to look at further Thank you, Professor Brown. That's a really useful answer. I suppose that in the practical implications of things, though, the way we stop the spread of the virus is very much still social distancing, staying two metres apart, hand washing and wearing a face covering and not leaving unless we absolutely need to because of the spike of cases in Leicester. So I know there are a few questions which have popped up in the Q&A and they're to do with why Leicester? And I'm going to come on to those a little bit later. We also have a few questions which have popped up about risk groups and the implications for those groups. And we'll ask those questions in a really, really short period of time. I want to just go through the basics about what to do if somebody in your household becomes sick. Or what do you do if somebody in your household has typical symptoms of coronavirus? So I'm going to come to Dr. Wadworth. So Dr. Wadworth, what do you do if you get sick with corona, coronavirus-like symptoms or somebody in your house gets sick? Yes, that's that's very important, uh, Dr. Kabasi. So in a way, in spite of all the havoc this has caused, the virus is um, good, if I can use the word, in, in the sense that very few people get very seriously unwell. So most people will recover with very mild illness or sometimes they will have the infection and no symptoms at all. So most people who are ill with it would be able to get better just at home. They don't need to uh, usually go and see a doctor. They don't need to be admitted into a hospital. So unless you're very unwell, and we'll come to that in a minute, unless you are very unwell, um, you don't, don't need to go to a chemist. You do not need to go to your GP stay at home. That's the biggest message. If you feel you have any of the symptoms that Dr. Garcia mentioned earlier, uh, you really need to stay at home and not go out. So if you need food, you need medicines, you need to get somebody else to bring it to you, you do not go there. If 
there is one person ill in the house, the advice is that ideally they should stay in a separate room as much as possible. Use a separate bathroom if that is possible uh, for the ill person or ill people in the house. Um, keep washing hands regularly because there may be other people in the house who haven't got the infection and if you don't wash your hands and they don't wash their hands, there is always a risk of spreading within the household. Um, the ill people who have the symptoms should ideally as much as possible wear a face covering or face mask when they are with other members of their household to prevent the spread to the other. Uh, these are the few of the things uh, you can do to, to reduce the spread to within your household uh, and to manage yourself. Thanks, Dr. Wadwa. That's really useful. Um, and also, there will be other sort of serious symptoms by which people will need to seek medical attention for. So trouble breathing or pain or pressure in the chest, perhaps. Somebody who could become confused or, or bluish lips. Now, I'm going to actually come to testing. Do these people who are in the home who have symptoms of coronavirus need to be tested? Um, and I'm going to go to Professor Brown with that question, if I may. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, I think this is really quite important because as a, for, from our point of view, from public health, we have a, a, a few tools at our, our availability and a number of people would have heard right at the beginning of coronavirus uh, and different countries have taken that, adop adopted that, that approach of we need to test, test, test. And the reason why we need to test is that when people know what their condition is, they're in a position to take action in relation to it. So one of the things that you would have seen, if you are symptomatic, we absolutely want you to go and have a test. If you're above the age of five, you are eligible to be able to go and have a test. We are doing everything we can to make that testing easier, more available. Some of you in your communities would have seen uh, pop-up testing stations coming up. You would have seen little local areas that are, that are offering testing around the, the city please make sure you use them because that way you can either assure yourself that everything's all right for the time being, take the, your appropriate action. But if you are positive, it means that then you, just as Dr. Wadwell says, you go home, you, you, you self-isolate for your seven days, members of your household isolate for 14 days, just to make sure that that's not being passed around to somebody else, because that's the challenge. It's not just about you, inadvertently you can infect other people people that you love people that you care about um and it can be as, as, as we said for the vast majority it may be fine but for some people it, it can be terrible so that's the reason why we would really encourage people to take the testing offer that will be coming their way thank you professor brown how, how do people get tested right. so if you've got symptoms, you could there's, there's the, if you go on the NHS website, that, that will that will you can just book a test or you can call 119. That will allow you to have a test. At the moment, we're doing something quite interesting. So you might even receive a knock on the door um, in some areas where a test might will be offered to you. Um, you might have a local testing station that is available to you. I mean, we've got them. We've got walk-ins on Spinney Hill Park. We've got them in Belgrave Neighbourhood Centre. We've got them in a ballpark in Humberston. We've got quite a lot all over the place. If you go on the website, it will tell you exactly where all of these are. Uh, and it's as simple as that. Make a call, uh, book online, and you can go and have your test. Thanks, Prof Brown. I, what's the point of getting a test? So let's say I'm at home, I develop a cough, a fever, um, and I'm feeling really unwell, then I think I've got coronavirus. Is there any point in me going to get a test? How does that help everybody else in actually coming out of lockdown? It helps for a couple of reasons. So uh, it was interesting right at the beginning of coronavirus, everybody who coughed, um, everybody thought they had coronavirus, um, they isolated, uh, but then they got another cough. <laughs> um, so people kind of wanted a bit of certainty as to what is it, do I actually have it? So that certainty is quite important. Also for me, um, it's really important because I need to understand what we call the epidemiology, you know, the who, the what, the when, the where, uh, and that also helps me to be able to manage the, the risk of transmission to other areas. So if I know at an early stage, right, I'm seeing a, an increase in high fields. The earlier that I can find that information out, 
the more that I can target of our resources to be able to deal with that. So, so th there, are, there are a couple of reasons for the individual so that they know and can take the appropriate action, but equally for others so that we know so that we can support um, other communities to make sure that it doesn't spread. Thank you, Prof. Brown. So clearly testing is a key for us to come out of lockdown because it's going to give us key data on what's happening in Leicester and where we're going to go. Um, that's really, really useful, Professor Brown. So the key message is there when it comes to testing is get tested if you have symptoms, get tested if there's anybody in your household who has coronavirus. And it seems that it's really easy to book a test by going to the website or calling NHS 119. So I have had a few telephone calls from really concerned patients and particularly when their children are becoming unwell. Um, and when children become unwell, naturally parents become very anxious. Parents want to know, what's the risk of my child becoming sick with coronavirus? Dr. Garcia, what is the risk? Thanks, Dr. Kapasi. Um, well, from like Ivan has said, we are building the plane as we're flying it in a way, and we are learning about COVID-19 as we go along. Um, and in one way, it's a it, they, we, we cannot say definitively, but certainly the evidence is showing that we think COVID-19 doesn't affect children as seriously as it does affect adults. So a lot more children may be asymptomatic and a lot more children may just have mild illness, thankfully. So whilst our parents are very worried and I, I'm a parent too and completely understand that, the evidence is that most likely the, the kid, your child will be OK. At the same time, though, when you when your little one has symptoms um, or has, remember I talked about flu like symptoms, so children tend to not present with the other stuff. They tend to present with those runny nose, sore throat, temperature, fluey, basically. Think about COVID-19 and think about testing and testing is available for children as well. And we go back to that. We are a community and we are taking responsibility as a community for COVID-19 at the moment. So if our children could possibly have it, there's something about making sure that we isolate our little ones and we isolate ourselves as a household in, in tandem with that according to guidance. If you are worried about your little one, you do the same things that you would do normally if that you're worried, which is that you can speak to what you can speak to 111, you can speak to your GP and get more advice or go online. And of course, we can make sure that, that you are your question. We ask you more questions. Your children can be examined if necessary um, and we can work out whether they need testing. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. So, so really, um, thankfully, children don't seem to be affected in a severe way from coronavirus. But we must also just consider the symptoms which mean that we need to access medical care. I think as a GP, it's really, really important that parents still continue to seek medical advice for their children as they would do normally, because that means they don't become more unwell. Um, and that's a really, really important message we wish to propagate um, especially after discussion with some of the paediatricians from the Leicester Royal Infirmary. So moving on from children, I'm going to come to uh, minority ethnic groups and the diversity of Leicester is something that we celebrate. Um, but we also have a high proportion of people here who are at higher risk because they're in black and Asian minority ethnic groups. How high is that risk? Professor Brown? This, this, this is, this is a, a, you know, a, an interesting and a fascinating question. Um, we, 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 we have colleagues in, in, in the city that are leading on this, and I, I think of, of Professor Kamlish Kunti, who's written quite widely around this. So, so what, what we think that we know is, is that there seems to be a, a disproportional risk for a whole range of things. Uh, with that, there, there is a risk in terms of being a man. Uh, there is a risk in terms of your age structure, but there also seems to be a differential risk in relation to ethnicity. Now, the complexity around this is what might that be? It's very difficult to take out things like, 
you know, deprivation, levels of exposure from the job, all those kind of aspects. Um, quite difficult to actually be, to pinpoint it down. Um, is this something that is, as, as I said, about us in terms of our, our ethnicity, or is this something about, you know, the society societal place that we hold? So uh, what we can say is that it does seem to be uh, picking out uh, people in a, in a very, very differential way. Uh, I think we have to take real precautions around that. Uh, I think that we it's in, inherent on in our communities, the things that we've said before about how we look after one another and, and how we how we look after those that we come into contact with. I think that's absolutely key and we take our responsibility in relation to that. But I can assure you that there's going to be many, many a, um, a research paper being written and continue to be, to be written uh, in, in order to try to get to the bottom of just how much that is. But my, my key message is it is as important more important, particularly important, uh, that we as those communities do everything we can to look after ourselves and to look after others within our communities. Thank you, Professor Brown. That's really useful to know that actually these groups are at high risk and we need to do more as a city to ensure that we protect this group. And also the reason, as you quite rightly outlined, is, is biological, perhaps genetic, perhaps there could be health inequality reasons as to why people are affected disproportionately in black and Asian minority ethnic groups. What does this mean practically though? What do we do? How do we actually reduce the risk in black and Asian minority ethnic groups? Is there anything that you could advise, Professor Brown? I, I, th I think this is, you know, I love this, I love this format and I, and I really want us at some point to have a real conversation around inequalities and what that truly means. What does that really mean for our health outcomes? Because all of those issues about our, you know, our health, what we eat, uh, you know, our exercise, our access to healthcare. I think that if COVID does anything, it should bring that right to the forefront. So we really need to start to think very, very seriously about, uh, you know, our health status, not just in relation to COVID, but around our overall health. Because diseases like COVID come along and they try to almost reap, you know, any areas of weakness that, that are within us. So what I'm saying is if anybody is going to listen to those messages. So, you know, some people will say, well, actually, it doesn't really affect me, you know, or, or I'll manage it. That is not a conversation that we as a BAME community should be having. We should be right on the forefront when we've spoken about those messages that you've spoken about, Doctor we should be taking those to heart more than anybody else uh, because we can see that the outcomes are affecting us more than anyone else. So it's not a magic bullet, it's not another panacea, it is about doing that more effectively. We're community minded, we want to be with people, but we are for this moment going to protect ourselves and others by following that guidance as stringently as we possibly can. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Brown, for that. Um, so Asian people, black people are more at risk. There are things that we can do to reduce that risk. And I know the academics at De Montfort University and the University of Leicester working really hard to answer many of these questions. And we're privileged to be in, in those groups and to try and provide those answers. Um, but I want to talk about the practical implications in terms of the diseases black and Asian people commonly have. So many of my Asian patients will have diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and the data shows that Asian people in particular have a high degree of these conditions. How do people look after these conditions? And is it more so important to manage these conditions properly? Dr. Wadwa. Sure, Dr. Kapasi. So that's a very, very good point because um, we know that diabetes is much more prevalent in Asian population uh, than it is in um, uh, other groups. Um, so obviously, if you're diabetic or if you have high blood pressure or if you have had diabetes for a long time and now your kidneys are damaged as well, you have had heart issues or have had a stroke, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, any of those complications make you more vulnerable if you get the coronavirus infection or any other infection for that matter. So if you're not healthy otherwise, 
if your diabetes is poorly controlled and so on, then if you get this virus, you're going to get much more affected. So one thing you can do is obviously to make sure that your other illnesses do not ignore them at this time. So there is big scare about coronavirus, but do not ignore your diabetes. Do not ignore your asthma or COPD. Do not ignore your medications for your heart or kidney issues that you might be taking. Um, if, if your routine checkup is due, that probably will have to wait a little bit. But if you think it is very poorly controlled, do not hesitate to pick up the phone and speak to your GP and say my blood pressure is not controlled or my sugars are very high so that that can be sorted quickly. So if you get infection, you're less uh, at risk from the infection. That's great, Dr. Weidman. That's really useful to know that we do need to manage our blood pressure, heart disease problems, sugar levels and diabetes, so on and so forth. And there was a question on the chat earlier which asked as to whether a patient should go in if they're invited for a blood test. Absolutely, you should be going in. If you're invited to go in for a GP appointment, if you're invited to go in for a hospital appointment, you should be going in. We're doing everything that we can in general practice and in hospitals to reduce the risk of transmission of the virus. I'm going to come on to that because we're on that point, Dr. Wadwa, and I'd just like to know how have GP surgeries changed um, in dealing with the pandemic? Absolutely. So this has uh, come on to us very quickly without much warning at all. And I think it is it is a success of a general practice how quickly we have adapted to this. We have kept our patients safe, our practices safe and our staff safe as well, which is equally important. So um, as we know, we we most of the practices are not letting patients in as, as a first point of contact. So my appeal to everybody tuned in is to spread the word. If you need your GP for anything, please pick up the phone and speak to the surgery. Do not go to the reception. Do not go to the door. Most doors would be locked. Doesn't mean that the practices are closed. There is a misconception. I, I've had some people saying, oh, the practices are closed. Uh, there is no practice which is closed at all. They're all open. They have staff working in the building. It's just that they are closed for you to walk in into the reception. So you can ring up. Many things will be um, sorted over the phone. We are using the technology much more just as we are having this conversation here rather than having it live in a theater. Maybe uh, we can do consultations over video over phone and sort a lot of problems. If that is not possible and you do need a face to face appointment or you do need urgent blood tests or any other investigations or you need to be examined by a doctor or anybody, you will be then asked to come to the GP surgery uh, and you will be examined. Now we are trying to keep our practices safe for our patients and for our staff as well. So it may be that when you are asked to come in, you are not asked to come into the, your own practice that you have been used all these years to come into. You may be asked to go to a different building or a different practice. Lots of practices are working together, so many practices have got together and then they have designated one building which is deemed much more safe where there are more facilities to see the patients face to face. So you may be asked to go to a different place. So don't think that that is bad when you, when you go there. Um, the the GPs or nurse or whoever you're seeing that they will have all your records on computer. They will know what's going on. You will get that continuity of care. So it's the same team that will be looking after you. It might be in a different building. Uh, so please do not go to the practice as a first point of contact. Uh, ring them up when you go, as we have said before, um, you, you wear the mask and obviously take all the social distancing precautions while you're there as well. Thank you, Dr. Madhwa. So in summary, wear a mask if you need to go to a GP surgery, social distance when you can, call up for any problems that you have. You will be treated in, in the same way in many ways, but also slightly differently in that most things will be managed remotely or by telephone to reduce the risk of coronavirus transmission. But also when you go to a practice, it could be somewhere different and that's to reduce your own risk of catching the coronavirus. And really important, I just want to reiterate this point, 
that you must go to your blood test appointments or if a doctor recommends that you need a face to face appointment, you should go to it because your other health conditions, if they're poorly controlled, could get you quicker than coronavirus would ever get you. I think that's really key. Um, so I'm going to talk about shielded patients next because there are a few questions on the chat about asthma in particular and COPD. Um, Dr. Garcia, who, what, what are shielded patients? How do shielded patients know that they're shielded patients? Just tell us very roughly about the concept, if you may. Thanks, Dr. Kaplasi. Yes, I think that um, shielded patients has caused a little bit of confusion, actually, um, mainly because of the guidance that came out with the, with um, the announcement of shielded patients at the beginning. If we take if I take us back right at the very beginning of lockdown, um, the government announced that we had a group of patients that were very high risk of suffering from the complications of COVID. And these high, this high risk group were named the shielded patient group because we thought that they deserved extra measures to protect them from acquiring COVID from the community. So in that situation, the, the people that we ended up sort of isolating as high risk or, 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 or giving them the label was mainly around people that were had transplants, for example, that were on um, certain drugs that compromised their immunity, that had cancer that were that could also compromise their immunity. I know there are lots of people with asthma and there are lots of people with COPD. And actually, asthma and COPD range from having very mild illness to being very severe. And it's about mainly with shielded patients capturing that group that are severe asthmatics and severe COPD. And they were very, very and they're very clear in who was would would be categorized as that, which is why only certain numbers of asthmatics and certain groups of COPD patients got shielded letters to let them know that they were in that shielded population. There are a number of other conditions and, and essentially the people that highlighted them were from a, a government database and your consultants as well, if they felt that that was the case. In some situations, if you had a number of a number of conditions that you would you together they would they would constitute a high risk that doesn't mean to say a lot of people with asthma and COPD and with other long-term or what we call long-term conditions so other chronic health conditions aren't at slightly increased risk as we've just described with BAME as with hyper um, hypertension as with diabetes and they would constitute something called a moderate risk. And at the beginning of lockdown, there wasn't a difference. But now, as we're coming through, well, not quite in Leicester, but hopefully at some point soon, we're going to be able to say that you have a moderate risk and therefore will require flu vaccinations and also think about sort of maybe being more careful with social distancing. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. That's a really useful commentary on shielded groups. So just to summarise, there are high risk groups, really high risk groups, and those groups normally are given a letter by public health, and these people know that they're shielded. There are other groups who are in the moderate risk category, so people who might have asthma, son, and so forth. And so if you don't have that letter, then you're not in that shielded group, as far as I understand. Um, now, when it comes to work, because we often have patients calling up the practice for sick notes, uh, what will constitute a sick note in this circumstance, Dr. Garcia? So essentially, we provided sick notes to our employers, basically, if you were in the shielded group, um, and we would recommend that you contact basically with um, with contact with the community essentially um, and if your employer couldn't provide you with remote working ability basically. Thank you very much Dr Garcia. So we want to get now we're going to get to the nub of our presentation and I call it the nub because people are desperate to know why Leicester has been affected so disproportionately. Um, there is a question on, on the Q&A and somebody is asking, 
what makes Leicester different? Why is Leicester affected? Why not Birmingham? Why not Manchester? Why not London? Why Leicester, Professor Brown? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And um, uh, one of the things, if somebody's got the total answer to that, I, I would welcome it. But the reality of it is, is that uh, Le Leicester is affected uh, from not one single source. It's been really interesting when you've looked at uh, lots of other places where you might say, well, there's a factory there or there's, you know, uh, something happened over there. What we're seeing in Leicester is that we've been relatively, relatively low in the middle of the pack. And then at the beginning of, of, of June, we just start to see that community transmission just start to ramp up. And if you're going to ask in the simplest way, why is Leicester affected? It's affected because the transmission routes that we had um, were made available. So, um, what what basically happened was that we were in a position where we could transmit the virus from one person to another. And that could have been for a whole host of things. It could have been through our working practices. It could have been through our home practices. It could be for a whole range of things. Uh, and everybody's looking for this kind of silver bullet. What was that? What what was that thing? Uh, and fortunately, I, I've got a, a whole bunch of very clever epidemiologists asking that very, very question. Going back contact tracing, asking people who, where were you? How did that happen? Uh, and so I'm, I'm hoping at some point we'll, we will be able to give an answer to that. But my my view is it will be a range of things. It will be a lot of local small things that all came together that allowed that spike and that rise to take place. So uh, unfortunately, there is not a single answer to this, but it goes right back to the, where we started this conversation, which is give the virus a chance and it will take the opportunity. Thank you, Professor Brown. So multitude of factors. Clearly, you know, the reason as to why Leicester is disproportionately affected is because the routes of transmission have been made available. So it goes back to preventing that spread initially. Um, when are we coming out of lockdown? Uh, you're, you're saving the best questions till last for me. Um, well, that will that that will lie with the Secretary of State. Um, what I can say is that we, as a city, and I do, I wanted to be able to say this before the, this this broadcast was over. We, as a city, have responded remarkably to the conditions that have been placed on us. If anybody walks the streets of Leicester at the moment, it I've never seen it like this. You know, people are are staying at home, people are, are minimising their risk. So we are doing all that we can. People are going to get tested and I ask for your cooperation on that. If we do all of the right things and it looks, it's very early, but the numbers look like they're going in the right direction, very much so. So we're starting to see some of that, that coming in and I hope we're going to accelerate that. Um, if we do that, we meet the conditions, we make sure that we have a very strong plan that, that keeps in that position. Uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we will be able to go to the Secretary of State and say, this is where we are. Um, this is what we're going to be doing in the future. Uh, please lift that. Uh, so I think that the date that we've been given for our for our review, our first review is the is the 18th of, of this month. So we are working as hard as we can to put together everything we can to show and make that case as to where we are now. But the big thing here is making sure that our population is safe, making sure that we're doing all of the right things and that we're in the best possible position. That's great. Thank you so much, Professor Brown. Really, really useful to know. Um, can you just remind us on what the current rules are? Just very, very briefly in terms of meeting outdoors, how many people can you meet? Where can you meet? So, so, so here's the formal and here's the informal, right? So, so, so formally, uh, where where we we're at with the relaxations that came in, it spoke very much around, you know, the closure of schools, the closure of non-essential shops, the the guidance that sat around um, people meeting. It was meant to be, you know, meeting outside groups of no more than six. That 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 was that's the guidance. However, what I'm really pleased to see is that Leicester have taken us back further and we have really gone to the you know what we're going to stay at home <laughs> and we're going to reduce our our, 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 um, our ability uh, or our, our opportunities for transmission so whilst yes we can meet outside whilst yes you know our bubbles still remain those ones that we had before in theory I think that what Leicester have done 
have they taken it to a level beyond that and said, no, we are going to go right back to that point where we are deciding that we are only going to come out when it's an essential journey. And I welcome that because that was self-determined. That was not about the guidance. That was about us as a city deciding this is what we're going to do. That's great, Professor Brown. That's really useful to know. And I, for one, I'm really looking forward to coming out of lockdown and I'm really looking forward to a date being set, just like my residents. Um, I just want to touch on support. Now, there's somebody who's just posted a question about them working in food banks. And I think it's fantastic that we have volunteers who are catering to people who are perhaps struggling financially during this outbreak. But there's social problems during lockdown, there's financial problems during lockdown, there are mental health problems during lockdown, physical health problems during lockdown. Can you give us a brief summary of what sort of support is out there, Professor Brown? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we are we are dealing with more than one pandemic here. So we are, we are dealing with the COVID pandemic, but we are also dealing with a pandemic that's arising as a consequence of COVID. So that whole conversation about, you know, uh, people's mental well-being, people's financial hardship, these are, the, these, these are long-term uh, entrenched health problems that are waiting to happen. That is the reason why we all are pushing so hard and we have to push hard to get the virus levels down so that we can come out of this because it has a long-term effect. What, what are we doing in the meantime? Well, on the, on, on the local authority website, there is a web page there that talks about what support is available. Now, we all recognise that, that, that there's going to be a lot of call on that, be it food banks, be it charitable organisations. There's going to be a lot of push and, and pull on those resources. Um, so whilst that information is there and there's lots of charities within our communities, within our faith groups that we try to, to access. But the real thing that we want to do is to be in a position where this is reduced, where people can have control back of their lives and can get back to the place where they can get some resource to be able to help them. But I would look on the local authority website uh, and that will give you some clues as to where you might be able to get some, some ongoing support through this difficult time. Thank you, Professor Brown and Dr. Wadwa, I believe you had some comments to make about the support available at this time. Absolutely, Dr. Kubasi. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Brown, for, for this summary. I would just like to remind that there is a huge amount of support available for anybody who's having any issues, either with uh, needing help at home because you're ill or you can't go out, uh, financial help, financial advice, mental help advice, because let's not forget how much um, it is causing stress and how many people with already mental health illness or people who even though never had any problems before are now having to suffer with uh, mental health issues. So there is a lot and lot of health, uh, help is available and I would like to remind here that we have set up um, many videos on our YouTube channel which is if you search Willows Health and there are um, 13 videos as we speak at the moment in 13 different languages and we plan to add more to them and a big section of those videos uh, tells you about what help is available. There's plenty of websites and telephone numbers, very practical. So go and look them up if you need any help at all. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wadwell, and I think that addresses some of the questions on the chat to do with how do we give support to people who are in that in in that in that sort of social economically deprived group or isolating at home. Also, um, so what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to come to a lot of the questions that are on the chat which we've not yet managed to answer. We did plan on finishing around eight, but it seems as if people still have plenty more questions. We're going to run for another 10 minutes or so um, and I'm just going to go through some of the questions on the chat. A particular theme keeps coming up is if I have coronavirus, am I going to get infected again, Professor Brown? Um, so so this has been a, re a, a really live issue um, and it's been interesting in the guidance because everything that tells us, you know, normally a virus when we've been exposed to it, um, that we build up our, our, our immune 
committed to it and we know that we are going to be, be, be fine after that. It's been interesting that there has been some debate uh, as to the level and the period of immunity that comes from having coronavirus. And this goes back to the point of this being a novel virus. It goes back to the point of us not quite knowing um, in entirety. So, so our feeling is the reality is it, it probably does. And certainly that was the question. Uh, that was the answer that was given in the early days. But equally, what we've been told now recently is that, that the evidence isn't as definitive as we would like. And therefore, people are still, if they've had coronavirus, are still being asked to um, isolate if they've got somebody in their house that has got coronavirus. So it's one where we don't have a definitive answer. Um, and we're having to still take the precautionary principle around it, but lots of work is being done just to confirm that 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 fact. But we're not quite there yet. Thank you, Professor Brown. That's really useful to know that we don't know as to whether we could be reinfected, and that research hopefully will tell us where we're going with that. Um, on testing, just very, uh, just very, just very shortly, there are some questions coming on of the type of testing available. Um, can you tell us about the two types of tests that are available, and in particular the antibody tests and whether they are available to the residents of Leicester, Professor Brown? So there was a lot of conversations that took place in the earlies about the type of test. So the vast, the vast majority of tests that you see in your testing centres, all of those are, are the antigen test. That's the one that just says, do I have it or don't I have it today? Um, uh, and that's those are widely available. Everybody knows about that, the swab in the back of your throat and up your nose. That's the one that, that people, people know well, and that's the one that's being rolled out and has a high degree of reliability that sits around it. But there's been the, this real rush, this real push to try and get the antibody test. Uh, and, you know, it was very much described as the, as the game changer. It's the one that will tell us whether we've had it and link to the previous question, hopefully the fact that actually, as the research comes on by, it might just tell us that we're immune from getting it again. As I said, we're not quite there yet. Um, the, anti, the antibody test um, was, there was one that was a so some of you will remember they went through lots and lots of different trials and they kept throwing different ones out. Um, they finally agreed on one um, and said that it did have efficacy. But the problem was it wasn't sort of one of those finger prick tests or one of those nice saliva tests. It was actually a blood test. Um, so that is not in the general circulation, but it is being used with, with, with healthcare staff just to try and help to both understand and for them to understand what their position is. So it's not widely available yet outside of that healthcare setting, um, but the antigen test is. Thank you, Professor Brown. That's really useful. So we've got the antigen test. We're hoping to have an antibody test, which will give us that little bit more information. Um, and I suppose the vaccine is, is, is a big part of this as well, isn't it? I mean, Am I going to get a vaccine, a coronavirus vaccine with my flu jab this winter, Professor Brown? That's that's the holy grail, isn't it? I mean, that's what we're everything that we've been doing has been trying to, you know, build up uh, some time for us to develop a vaccine. Um, now, the, the, the thing is with vaccine development is not ordinarily vaccines take a huge amount of time to develop. It takes years to develop an effective vaccine. We are in a situation where we are running um, to try and develop a vaccine. And many of you will have heard um, the conversations that sort of said that, you know, Oxford, for example, are, are leading the way in terms of their, their vaccine trials. But And we've got a number of likely candidates. But the truth of the matter is, we are not in a position where we can say we have a vaccine that looks imminent in terms of its delivery. Um, so certainly in terms of your winter vaccine, um, it's going to be your flu vac. I wish that it was going to be, you, you know, your 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 COVID vac, but we are still some way uh, from that. And that's why the things that we are doing remain incredibly important. So this is happening throughout the world at the moment. Um, researchers are collaborating their research in that rush to try and get that vaccine ready. 
But all the things are right. I mean, we're just in the point of efficacy trials at the moment uh, for some of those vaccines, but we are not in the point where we're talking about pr production. Thanks, Professor Brown. So I just want to make the point, by the way, that make sure you get your flu jab this autumn when it comes. We often forget that the flu, the winter flu kills people every year, less so than this coronavirus pandemic, but it puts people into hospital every single year and the flu vaccine protects against that. So that's just a really important point to make to anyone who is eligible to have the influenza or flu vaccine. Um, it's all very well having this webinar today and it's fantastic that we've got hundreds and hundreds of people here, but there are some questions about health literacy and also about how we communicate this message to communities who are less digitally enabled. Professor Brown, are we doing anything to try and reach out to those communities who may not have digital access? Yeah, I mean, this 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 is this is really key. I think if this this has taught us one thing, it is the diversity within our communities, the differentiation within our communities. I think things like this and the work that, you know, things like the like Willows are doing in terms of just trying to get that literacy, trying to get that those messages across to our community in a whole range of diverse ways. I, I think that things like this are leading the way. We've got a long way to go on this, but I think, uh, Dr. Kapasi, we are we are moving ever forward on that. But we've got we've got a huge distance to go yet. That's great. Thank you very much, Professor Brown. So um, I'm going to come to I'm I'm scrolling through the questions, guys. There's so many. Um, I'm just thinking about. Um, what else to ask you guys? I mean, there's a question about the R rate, um, Professor Brown. What is the R rate now in Leicester? Uh, so the R rate is the reproduction rate, which is how good a vaccine is, how, how is it spreading? And everybody would have heard this conversation about the R being like less than one, and that's what we've got to try and stick to. Um, I don't want to get sort of all, all statistical on, on, on everybody, but but in order to understand or in order to, to, to work out what your reproduction rate of a virus is, you actually need to know what the prevalence is. Um, you need to know how much of it is already in, in your community to work out, is it doubling, is it tripling, or is it, is, it, is it less than that? So every time you start talking about R rates um, at a local level, particularly, um, that becomes a very, very difficult figure to, to do with any degree of accuracy. We, we do it on a national basis, done through modelling, but when you start getting down to smaller numbers in communities, it, it becomes more meaningless. I mean, what we have basically told is that the R rate in Leicester is below one. Um, it, it, that, that's, that's what we've been told regionally. There's an regional R rate, but it's not a local R rate because of the numbers become very, very, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not accurate, it's not reliable. That's great. Thank you, Professor Brown. Um, last question. It's on the chat. Um, hospital admissions, what's happening with those in Leicester with the uptick of infections? Oh, is that for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. OK, um, uh, so either uh, Aruna can, can, can also come in yeah. on, on, on this one as well. Um, in fact, Aruna, I'm going to hand this one over to you because I think they're sick of my voice by now. It's, right. it's very informative, Professor Brown. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to. So I think the interesting thing with hospital admissions so far is that we noticed um, that overall the number of admissions to hospital and the death rate hasn't quite gone up. Um, we saw a slight increase, I think, in one of the hospitals, but that that cut, that was sort of attributed to when we had the initial lockdown or the initial news that we had a rise in Leicester. So it looks like at the moment it's quite stable and we haven't seen the mirroring of the increase in rate of infection that we've seen in Leicester back into the hospital admission rate. 
So I think that what we're saying is that at the moment it looks like we're maybe picking up. Remember I talked right at the very beginning about that moderate illness and mild to moderate illness and we may not be seeing the severity that we know that sits within the hospital admission group. And just to add to Dr Garcia's point and, and, and that what we have seen and the information that we have is that the, this outbreak is really unusual in Leicester because it is it is in the younger and more working age population. The mean the mean age for this is, is around 37, uh, which is much much younger than you, you you'd see in other parts of the of the, of the city, uh, of the country rather. Uh, and it goes back to the point that that um, uh, Dr. Capassi made before, which is for a number of people. I think it might have been Dr. Wadra actually for a number of people. Um, that are not in that particularly vulnerable group. They they get through this uh, and they and they they manage to to navigate it without needing additional hospital help or support. Um, so that is one of the one of the, the important things for us uh, that that we're not seeing that. But we've got to really be careful that this younger age group don't don't pass it on to an older and a more vulnerable group. That's great, guys. Uh, I think we're going to leave, leave leave it to that now when it comes to the answers to all of these questions which have been asked. I think it's been a really, really informative discussion. Um, I want to come to take home points. So I'm going to come to uh, Dr. Wadwa. Dr. Wadwa, what are your take home points for the people of Leicester? So people of Leicester, I, I'm going to say a few things. Stay at home till the lockdown is open. I know it's not nice. We know it's not natural. You want to go out. It's a human nature to go out and meet your loved ones, your friends and your family and enjoy the things that are there to enjoy. But for the moment, to save your lives and save the lives of others, stay home. If you feel you have symptoms, assume that it is coronavirus and then get yourself tested. If you have come into contact of anybody who might have had symptoms, please get tested. That's my advice. We do that. We stay home, we get tested, uh, we'll get over it and we will get over it. Thank you. So stay home, get tested, follow the advice that's been given. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Now, Dr. Garcia, any take home messages from your perspective at all? Sorry, was I, I was on mute. Um, take home messages for me are really about, you know, it's about the questions that are coming through um, on the on the side. I think that um, hopefully this has really helped with some of those questions and has helped some of the some of our citizens in understanding the lockdown. I want to reiterate uh, what Ivan, Dr. Professor Brown said at the beginning, which is this is a community. Um, issue and we need to make sure that if we can follow our lockdown guidance we should get out of this sooner rather than later and we've got to be thinking about protecting our fellow citizens our older people and our vulnerable people by making sure we follow the rules thank you very much dr garcia so we need to protect our shielded people mm. our vulnerable people our older people and we need to follow the advice now, Professor Brown, Director of Public Health, Leicester City, the man who's going to get Leicester back on back going again. What's the advice you're going to give to the people of Leicester? My, my, my advice is that it's building on what's already been said. I, I, I call this Leicester United versus the virus. Mm -hmm. It is about us as a united city saying that we are going to do what we need to keep that virus down under control out of our communities by following that guidance and that involves every single one of us it's not just 11 players on a football but that is all of us you know the 300 and odd thousand of us that are our city inhabitants um to really say that every single one the fact that my child washes their hand when they walk through the door is playing their part in trying to stop this virus the fact that my you know, auntie or my uncle is saying, you know what, I'm shielding, you drop that thing to me because I am playing my part in Leicester United against the virus. I want everybody to understand that they are a key player in this 
And actually, the part that they play is the thing that helps us to win. That's a really fantastic message to end. Professor Brown, United Leicester, I think we need to celebrate the city despite the challenges that we are in at this moment in time. We are very privileged to live in a diverse city which has tremendous potential in the centre of the UK. I'm convinced as somebody born in Leicester that we can get through this collectively. And I think the collaboration that people are showing, the unity that people are showing in this great city will mean that we will get through this and will come out of it stronger. Now, I'd like to adjourn our meeting today. I would very much like to thank the panelists, Professor Brown, Dr. Garcia and Dr. Wadva for joining us this evening. We are all frontline clinicians trying to fight this pandemic. I'd also like to thank all healthcare professionals in Leicester and nationwide, not just healthcare professionals, those people, you know, who are caring for people in care homes. The, the, the person who put the question on attending to a food bank, really trying to sort of work hard for people disadvantaged in this pandemic, but then also all the people of Leicester. In putting this webinar together, I think I'd really, really like to thank my team at Willows Health, um, particularly our Chief Information Officer, um, Kieran Mann, who has worked tirelessly to try and get the technicals of this sorted. Also, the doctors at Willows Health, the staff at Willows Health, everybody from the Leicester City Clinical Commissioning Group who have really tried to support us with this event, our partners at De Montfort University, and finally, our local doctors, our local teams, our local primary care networks. Thank you very much. Finally, nothing would happen without our star of the show, and that's Kavita, who really sort of supports everything that we do. Thank you very much, Kavita. So on a final note, do follow us on Willows Health. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. Our doctors in Leicester have put together lots of videos in different languages. So Gujarati, Hindi, Punjabi, English, Slovak, Hungarian, Cantonese, French, Creole. It's all there. It's amazing. It celebrates the diversity of our fantastic city. Also, um, also engage with those, share, like and follow the posts. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Thank you for joining us. And I very much hope that we can have something like this in the future as a regular feature to give public health messages. Thank you, everybody, for attending.